just uh, starting from the, the end, now the drug in Europe is approved for soft tissue sarcomas. Uh, soft tissue sarcomas are a um, mesenchymal tumor that is very difficult to treat. And uh, uh, so it was, for many years, there were no new drugs, essentially. So it was a sort of success to have an active drug in this uh, tumor. Uh, and uh, more recently for second line ovarian cancer in combination with uh, uh, liposomal doxorubicin. Uh, so I, I start, I was telling you that uh, the, this compound was extracted originally from a marine uh, tunicate, uh, are small uh, organisms that are, uh, um, that have uh, a, a cellulose, uh, um, uh, wrapped by cellulose, so they are called tunicates. And uh, in this case, it was extracted from the roots of mangroves in the Caribbean. So uh, I think that, uh, uh, well, this is the, the organism. And uh, the, actually, if you think at nowadays about anti-cancer agent, you, you may think that uh, to, to study natural product can be an old-fashioned approach somehow. Because you, you can think, well, now we know more about the biology of tumors, so we can really figure out uh, which kind of drugs we can really make to hit specific targets and then to, to have a rational drug development. So uh, I think that uh, this is probably is, is going to be true for some classes of compounds. That's, for example, some kinases for which some success has been obtained. But altogether, maybe we'll discuss at the end, I still think that natural products are still a, a possible source of new compounds because we still know relatively little about cancer. So what, before starting to really decide if to really work with the natural product or not, we, we think in general, the people that work in this area think that, of course, uh, you need a, a novel structure. Of course, you, you don't, you're not interested to, to work in natural product for which there, is, there are already some compounds that are already uh, similar. Novel mechanism of action, and this is really very difficult topic because in many cases, natural products have more than one mechanism, and this is the reason why they are so, so biologically so active. So anyhow, at least to have some original mechanism of action, some mechanism of specificity for some tumors, and possibly to have also activity against some tumors for which no drugs are available. So, I mean, you highly justified to study even a, a compound for which the mechanism is not completely elucidated, but uh, you have proved that uh, it's biologically active. And obviously, uh, um, manageable toxicity because many natural products are very toxic, and so you, you have to, to have a, a, a good therapeutic index to, to, to use this compound. I don't know if there are chemists here. Uh, no, well, anyhow, uh, generally, chem every time that I show this kind of structures, the chemists are really fascinated by them because uh, they, uh, they represent a sort of challenge for chemists that want really to, to synthesize this kind of compound. Uh, because really nature has really been extremely, uh, <laughs> uh, has taken many, many years to develop this kind of, of compounds. And uh, in fact, uh, at Harvard, the Nobel Prize for Chemistry uh, really resynthesized this compound, it's Corey. And uh, I mean, it's a sort of uh, really prove how good you are as a chemist to really reproduce what nature has done. But even some small molecules that I have uh, been working, many cases have many uh, chiral centers, so it's very difficult to make them. Anyhow, this was really, now is, is, is possible to do it synthetically. And for the clinical use now is uh, produced semi-synthetically. So they start from a, uh, a compound that is much more easy, obtainable, and then. But at the beginning, it was really used the natural product, uh, really extracted from this organism. So this, well, there are these three rings of tetraisoquinoline, quinolone rings. And there is this group here that is, uh, sorry, it's probably gone. No, okay. This group here that is the only reactive group that reacts with DNA in a covalent way. So, um, as I told you, initially we just tried to see what happened in cells. So, Eugenio 
took a number of cell lines and started to see if it was toxic, if what, what was. It was extremely potent. And so, uh, I mean, this was just some example of uh, experiments, and I think special, but uh, there were cons already one nanomolar concentration, and even less, were already effective inhibiting colony formation in many tumor cells. Now, so we, we had a very uh, good collaboration with the National Cancer Institute in the States. No? So the, the European organization he was mentioning is a sort of sister organization with the, with the NCI. So it was very easy to, to, to really collaborate. And so probably, I don't know if you know, but uh, at that time, many, some years ago, they were using 60 cell lines uh, to do the screening of, the, the, of new compounds. And they had also the possibility to compare the results that obtained with the new compounds with all the data obtained with thousands and thousands of compounds. And so if they found what they call comparative negative, Give, gave you an indication that th th that compound was somehow different from all the others that have been tested before. <coughs> in some cases, you can really pinpoint even a mechanism. So you have a new compound that behaves a exactly like camptotechins. So you're probably going to, to st study a new topoisomerase one inhibitor. So there is this kind of... Uh, so for this compound, the, the NCI made the, the screening and found that uh, there was no uh, relations between the pattern of sensitivity to this compound and any other compound. So this was good. Uh, uh, we, we started to do some experiments in cells, looking at cell cycle and this kind of, of aspects that are generally seen for us, just to orient the, the kind of studies to do the mechanism of action, because of course if you find all the cells in mitosis, you, you look at the anti as an <coughs> antitubular agent, I mean you start to to have orient your research towards more um, uh, molecular mechanism. And in terms of the cell cycle, I don't know if you are familiar with this kind of biparametric uh, evaluation of the cell cycle. Essentially, you treat the cells for one hour. At, at the end of the treatment, you have a pulse of bromodeoxyuridine, so you can follow the kinetic of the cell. And these are the control cells untreated, and you see that uh, there is a progression towards the cell cycle. So these are the uh, bromodeoxyridine positive, so they are in S phase, they are G1 cells and G2 uh, cells. Now you can see that after treatment, already after a, a short time of treatment, uh, three hours, uh, one hour and uh, two hours of uh, post-incubation, you have already evidence of difficulty of cells to go out from the G1, and then you have a prolonged S, so many cells are in S for a long time, and then a block in G2. So there were many, many kind of perturbations in the cell cycle. Then we asked the question, is there any specific sensitivity in different phases of the cell cycle? Many uh, DNA damaging agents uh, are much more active in cells that are in S phase. And this is obviously due to the fact that they uh, are more <coughs> vulnerable in terms of, uh, of the, I mean, if you cause DNA damage for, for cell in S phase. In this case, well, we, we uh, use elutriation to really enrich cells. This is cells that are in G1 as G2. If you enrich the cells by elutriation in G1 in S and G2, and then you do a short treatment during this time and ask the question, are, is there any difference in sensitivity? And there is a difference, but it was very interesting, this difference, because apparently cells with, that were in G1 were more sensitive than cells in S and G2. So this was, again, another peculiarity that attracted us. Well, this is an interesting observation because actually more solid tumors do not have a very large fraction of cells in S phase, like leukemias. Uh, I collaborated then with Paola Lavena, that is an immunologist that uh, works with Alberto Mantovani, and now is at Manitas. And uh, she is, uh, the, the, their group is very, uh, is very expert in monocytes and macrophages. So I asked her if she could provide me some monocytes uh, to, to test if acquiescent cells could be also sensitive. So they were telling me, well, this is a useless experiment because monocytes and macrophages are very resistant cells to drugs generally. It's very difficult even with radiation to kill them. Instead, unexpectedly, this compound was extremely effective on monocytes. 
And also, Paola uh, extracted some uh, tumor-associated macrophages, and so they, they were sensitive to the drug. But what she observed then in further experiments, and this is a line of research that is now very productive, that at very low concentration, the monocytes uh, do not produce, do not secrete the same level of some cytokines and chemokines. So at very low concentration, these compounds modulate the secretion of uh, uh, chemokines and some of the factors that you recognize as important, potentially important factor for angiogenesis of tumor growth. So this was a finding obtained by Paul and now is becoming more and more important. Uh, maybe at the end I will tell you uh, what we are doing at the moment on this. Now, um, <coughs> when we started to work with the NCI, we then we, we, we asked the, uh, what was the best group working on DNA and uh, um, structure, you know, to, to really investigate how really to, to um, work out a model for the interaction of DNA. Now, uh, we, we could, uh, um, for, with the chemical method, detect that the drug was binding to nitrogen-2 of guanine. It is also unusual because most of alkylating agents are used in cancer chemotherapy bind to N7 of guanine, so in the major group of DNA. In this case, N2 uh, of guanine is in the minor group of DNA. So this means that the drug really is, uh, goes, uh, is uh, matches uh, to the um, uh, minor groove and then probably slowly react uh, with, by proximity with the nitrogen uh, to of guanine because it's not the most reactive uh, site in DNA. So, <coughs> uh, Lawrence Harley in California helped us to uh, do the studies with, uh, with the, um, NMR and uh, established that the drug binds in the minor group, but he, he found also that uh, there is also a ring of, of the structure. You saw that there was three, three ring, one, ring C, that is out of DNA. And I, I will be short sure now, not giving you all the data, but there were some other compounds that we obtained that didn't have this ring C, and were much less active, much less potent, actually. So uh, we thought that the, this part of the molecule probably was very important. So we, we, we thought that maybe that uh, the drug is not really causing problem to, to replication of DNA. In fact, this phase is not particularly sensitive. Maybe, maybe it is, is interfering with some DNA binding proteins. So maybe transcription factor, maybe DNA repair proteins. This, this will be probably the direction to take. So we did some experiments uh, using a number of transcription factors in vitro, doing experiments uh, in collaboration with Roberto Mantovani, that is uh, a transcription person, and uh, uh, we, we started to do some gel shift assay uh, in vitro with a number of factors. And we found something and published a paper, but uh, we were not convinced at all that this was a, an important mechanism because we obtain good positive results using 10 micromolar. Instead, in cells, the, the drug works in nanomolar, in the mano, nanomolar range. So we thought this is just a curiosity, but probably is not the mechanism. But instead, we realized that in cells, you can have modulation of transcription. Maybe that in vitro, in this case, in vitro, when you have just the transcription factor in DNA, you really need to really modify the binding in a very, very important way. Instead, in vivo, in the cell, when there are complexes, the ge geometry is much more crucial. So maybe a subtle change in the structure can be even more relevant. So it might, might make sense in, the, in this case, because generally it's the opposite. No? So if you have an in vitro result at, at a high concentration, you will never see in cells. In this case, may, may, maybe uh, s somehow not, not, uh, not, stra not too strange. Anyhow, the experiment that was done, again in collaboration with Roberto Mantovani, was uh, in cells transfected with uh, the promoter of HP70 that was associated to a reporter gene. So this was a, a simple system because switching, um, changing the, the temperature, there, there, there is a rapid uh, uh, induction of transcription, and in this condition, the drug concentration has started to be much uh, 
uh, closer to those that are pharmacological relevant, 3 nanomole, 10 nanomole, and so on, there was 10 nanomole, it was uh, very clear the, the effect. We, we investigated more in detail and we found that it was related to transcription, so this uh, kind of uh, mechanism. So there was a strong modulation and, well, uh, we were thinking that it was mainly related to an NFY, but uh, it was very clear after some experiment that it was not so. There were factors that were not related to the cut box and that were also affected. There was unpredictable uh, modulation of transcription. In some cases there was upregulation, in some cases downregulation. So we didn't really work out exactly what, what is the precise mechanism. Certainly there was some uh, evidence that in, within a system, within a cellular system, you had a reproducible uh, change in transcription of uh, a specific way. So you didn't have a lot of changes, but some specific changes that were, could be reproduced and probably somehow promoter dependent. We investigate also DNA repair mechanism and uh, also at, at, again in collaboration also with other groups. And uh, I would like just to, to, to really focus on very few uh, aspects of this because uh, we, we investigated mismatch repair and there are cell lines that are deficient in mismatch repair and we, find, we found no difference in cells that were mismatch proficient and deficient. Uh, we, we then uh, investigated nucleotide excision repair deficiency and then we investigated double strand repair. Now for the nucleotide excision repair, uh, we had this finding that uh, we have not published for many years because we thought it was, didn't make any sense because cells that were deficient in nucleotide excision repair, instead of becoming more sensitive, like happens with many other DNA damaging agents, became uh, become partially resistant. This is the unique unique property of this compound that uh, was then published by other people before us because we we every body I was speaking with in, term, in the field of DNA repair was telling me that it didn't make any sense. <laughs> this, uh, in in fact, actually, probably what what is the reason for this is that. Probably cells that are deficient in uh, nucleotide excision repair have a much more efficient homologous recombination repair. This is, at the end, what I think is, is the major thing. There are other, other theories, actually. That, uh, there are other theories that, uh, for example, there has been a group working in East that uh, think that uh, uh, the drug could form some complexes uh, with DNA in some of these DNA repair uh, proteins. So it, uh, similar to what happens for uh, um, topoisomerase poisons. So essentially entrapping uh, into DNA some protein that is related to nucleotide excision repair. This has been somehow not really demonstrated but proposed for XPG uh, that is one of, the, of these proteins, the nuclease. This was Giovanna Damia finding uh, and then other people did many experiments and finally we did some experiments with uh, some is isogenic systems, uh, isogenic cells that really provide you a much more clear picture using these cells that for which there is um, CHO cells for which there are many different uh, mutations in different genes of, of this part of DNA repair and also of uh, homologous recombination and non-homologous and joint and uh, now I give you just the summary for this. So essentially wh what is really makes a, a major difference is homologous recombination. So if you have def a deficiency in homologous recombination, you have a much higher sensitivity to the antiproliferative effect of the drug. Uh, this might be relevant now in, in the clinic because there are um, uh, breast tumors and ovarian tumors that are deficient in BRCA1 and 2 that are uh, possibly more susceptible to this drug. This is in fact something that is uh, ongoing in terms of clinical investigations. The other thing is that as I was telling you there was a partial resistance of three four times. It's not that, that difference like homologous recombination for nucleotide excision repair and so uh, you have this uh, particular pattern that is for the homologous recombination, I must say that it is also similar to cisplatin because also for cisplatin, if you have deficiency in homologous recombination, you have more susceptibility. And in fact, 
cisplatino is not a drug that is used in breast cancer except for the cases that are BRC1 and, and 2 uh, mutated in which now they are using cisplatin so, or analogs of cisplatin. Instead for the um, nucleotide repair, as I told you, there was this uh, funny story. Now, at that point, we had a drug that appeared to be interesting, but we didn't know about this, uh, if it, it could be a drug. So we obtained enough drug by, by this uh, Spanish uh, biotech, his name is Pharmamar, um, that uh, allowed us to do experiment in mice. And Raffaella Giavazzi of our department, that is, uh, has obtained over the years many xenografts of tumors, in particular ovarian cancer, tested this compound, and I show you uh, results in one or two, um, in one model, that uh, was not particularly sensitive to the other drug, so it was interesting for us, and for which uh, this drug, trabectidine, was extremely uh, active. You see there was a very prolonged uh, response, this is the volume of the tumor, the tumor volume, and these are the treatment, three treatment, and then you, you see there are two things that are really peculiar. Well, one is the very, very good response, very long, but also, at that time we didn't notice, but now we, we, we know that it's an important feature of the drug. If you notice, you, do you, not, you don't have a, a rapid effect. You, you, the, the tumor goes on growing and then you have some, some decrease of the tumor volume. Raffaella showed also that when the tumor was also in bi a, big, a relatively big size, was still sensitive and this was really increasing our interest. So we, we investigated also other tumor models, and at that point we started to think that this could be a, a drug. And so again, we asked the help of the NCI, that were extremely, extremely generous and help, helped us a lot because they formulated the drug, so they, they made it possible to test the toxicology and also the, the clinical activity. But uh, the, what happened was that during tox toxicology, they found that the drug was hepatotoxic, so it caused toxicity to the liver, and so they explored all the species up to the monkeys and found that all the, the species, the drug was hepatotoxic. So they decided they didn't want to go on in the States. And uh, we actually um, were instead very, I mean, we discussed much more about this because uh, we said, after all, uh, the, the toxicity you have, for example, in mice, uh, for, well, maybe I show you also in the other, some other picture here. For example, in this model, given the drug which is platinum, you can cure some mice, and this tumor it cannot be cured with any other uh, treatments. So we said, maybe there are situations in humans that are similar to this, and in mice we can give relatively tolerable dose with reversible toxicity. So it is, it's right to drop a drug if it's apotoxic. So we, we started to study a bit more about this problem of toxicity, and we found out that the apotoxicity was worse in the rat than in the other species. And anyhow, also in the rat, unless you use very high doses, is reversible. Was anyhow dose dependent, so you could really detect it, supposing a clinical investigation starting from low doses and increasing doses. So we, we had really some uh, really very uh, strong discussion with, between the Americans and the Europeans, and then this uh, committee uh, of European uh, that I was chairing, but in this committee there were also to some toxicologists, some uh, clinical oncologists, some chemists, so it was really a variety of expertise, decided to start the clinical investigation very, very carefully. So the clinical investigation went uh, relatively well, because, uh, again, the toxicity was uh, reversible. The, the main toxicity was actually bone marrow toxicity, not hepatotoxicity, but the hepatotoxicity was the most uh, annoying kind of toxicity because hepatotoxicity means like to have an hepatitis, so the patient feels very, very uh, tired and uh, it's not particularly pleasant to, to, to have, uh, I mean, to, to have this kind of but anyhow, the, 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 the biochemistry, the, the, the values of transaminase became normal after each cycle, and there was not any death for, for, this, for this toxicity. 
during the phase one study, it was, we were lucky because there were some patients that had sarcomas and responded to the therapy. And this, of course, increased the interest in the drug because uh, uh, it's very difficult to see uh, response in this tumor. But it was really an important drawback of the drug. So I, I started a collaboration with the British group uh, in Leicester that were really uh, had a, an unit that was called Hepatotoxicology Unit of MRC, uh, in which they were really experts in how uh, are how hepatotoxic the drug, the mechanism, how really try to counteract this mechanism. So we started with the hepatocytes, ex doing experiments with, with hepatocytes, but we didn't see anything special with hepatocytes. Then we, we did some experiments in the rat that were the most sensitive uh, species. And the pathologist uh, of Leicester, um, um, Peter, uh, told us, I think that uh, the initial event in hepatotoxicity is an inflammation in the biliary duct. So wh why don't we try some anti-inflammatory agents? And do doing these experiments was uh, amazingly active uh, using uh, dexamethasone. You know, an early thing that we see just after three days of treatment is just to damage to biliary duct. And with the dexamethasone given at least 24 hours before, there was no uh, sign of toxicity. If you uh, take uh, at further time points, here you have really strong hepatotoxicity and here you don't have any hepatotoxicity. So uh, I'm not exaggerating, this guy called me and said, you didn't give the drug to these animals because it's impossible, this was so effective. Uh, and so we repeated the experiment, it was really very, very clear that it was working. So this is not so important, they, they managed also to look at the gene profiling, but is somehow is the same level to see the toxicity somehow reproduce the fact that you have toxicity. Now, so with this data, I, I convinced the people, the clinicians at the Studio Tumori, uh, this is a young uh, oncologist, uh, Federica Grosso, that works with uh, Casali. Uh, There's a group working on sarcoma at the National Cancer Institute in Milan. And so they, they simply tried to, to do, to do uh, steroid premedication 24 hours before and the, the toxicity of uh, liver was much, dec really strongly decreased. And so now the drug is given with this protocol, given dexamethasone the day before, and then they go on uh, using dexamethasone. I'm not convinced that this is really useful, but they start in this way and it's very difficult they will change this. But anyhow, it is certainly it's like another drug, so much more tolerable and with much less problems. Uh, there was also another compound that we, together with this British group was working very well, but we didn't, so far we have not tested in clinic and now I'm managing to test it. It was another natural product that is very, very well known by people working in chemo prevention. It is indoltricarbinol. It is the, the, the compound, it's, uh, cabbage is very rich in this compound, cruciferous are very, I mean, is, uh, is the compound that has been uh, uh, I mean, proposed to be one of the best chemopreventive agent, uh, also for breast cancer because it has also anti-estrogen effects. This was working very well, and now probably we are going to do some uh, a, a clinical investigation in, in breast cancer because at least in, uh, uh, in, the, in uh, um, this tumor of the rat, uh, certainly the combination of the two uh, drug, I mean, indoltricarbinol and uh, um, um, trabectin appears to be very effective with no toxicity. Now, <clears throat> you know, maybe that you don't know how the, uh, the, not all of you know how a drug is investigated in the clinic. What happens is generally you do a phase one study to establish the doses that you can give, and you start to study the pharmacology, the toxicity. Then you do phase two studies oriented to detect in specific tumors, which is the activity. Now, uh, it was done the phase two study in, sar in sarcomas, but sarcomas are very heterogeneous, and a very heterogeneous uh, series of different diseases. They put all together because they are relatively rare, but it's like to put together carcinomas, doesn't make much sense. But on the other hand, uh, practically is, uh, the, if you want to, to to do a trial, you do sarcomas, no? but really it's very difficult to do a study because different disease with different bi biology and so on. 
So the, the um, uh, authorities that approved the, the, the drug in Europe uh, really ask some more data. And since the, the, the best data in the previous phase to study were obtained leiomyosarcoma and liposarcoma, uh, ask to, for the registration some sort of comparison. But at that point, we knew already that this compound was somehow active. So the clinicians we were in contact said, well, I don't, I, if I know that this is active, I don't know, I don't have any comparator. So I, 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 we tried to compare it, to have a comparison between two schedules and see what happens. It was an extremely risky thing because they could also see no difference and the, in terms of registration would have been a failure. But they were lucky because the, the, the three-week schedule was better than the other. And uh, <coughs> you see, this is the every three weeks, this is every week. And this is historical comparison with the old trials done in Europe with for sarcomas. So historically, it appeared to be much better than bo with both schedules. And this schedule appeared to be better. However, uh, also, these studies were done with all liposarcoma and with, uh, uh, and, uh, with uh, leiomyosarcoma, as you see. So, so these are, uh, in this uh, patient series, there were also a really very heterogeneous number of patients. Again, this uh, uh, oncologist that was mentioning before, Federica Grosso, uh, I mean, it was a coincidence, but uh, when we wrote the paper about the hepatotoxicity, uh, the referee asked us to check if the tumor activity was still maintained after the dexamethasone. It was an obvious question, difficult to answer because it was not a big clinical study comparison. But anyhow, she went back to all the cases that were treated with trabectinib without the dexamethasone and plus the dexamethasone and compare the effect, efficacy. And she really uh, collaborated with the radiologist, uh, looking at all the, 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 the uh, X-rays and all the um, nuclear magnetic resonance uh, image. And uh, in the Instituto de Tumori in Milan, uh, there is a strong experience in one uh, sarcoma, this is gast gastrointestinal sarcoma. This is a tumor extremely sensitive to Glebeck. And in this case, this radiologist knew that uh, the initial response to Glivec is not a tumor shrinkage, but is a change in tissue density. So looking at all this, uh, this image, they realized that there were cases in which there was a similar kind of pattern. So there was a change in the uh, structure of the, the tissue somehow before changing the dimension of the tumor. And they realized that all these cases uh, belonged to a specific subclass of patients that had a, a particular liposarcoma. This is called myxoid liposarcoma. It is one of the most frequent liposarcoma that are, however, are very rare disease. And uh, here, so we, we asked the pathologist to look at all this uh, uh, morphology of these tumors because some patients had also received the drug and then were operated. And uh, Silvana Pilotti, that is a pathologist, uh, a really very expert in sarcoma, uh, proposed that uh, the drug uh, for this specific tumor induces differentiation. So uh, it was really difficult to believe this, but uh, she said actually, uh, well, this is a particular picture. In many cases, you see a sort of benign tumor after the treatment. So it was extremely, of course, extremely attractive, and interesting, much more interesting than we thought before. Uh, so, uh, what Paolo Casali did at Instituto de Tumori was to try to contact all the centers in the world that had been, st uh, uh, were studying the drug. So, in the States, uh, uh, in Boston, in London, in uh, France, and in Spain. And so, they put together all the series of patients retrospectively that had been treated with the trabectidine. And they found that in myxoid liposarcoma, and these were all patients that received several lines of therapy before, uh, in this specific tumor, more than 50%, 50% of cases responded at a, a shrinkage of the tumor after a few cycles, and had a, 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 cl a clear benefit that it lasted uh, uh, progression-free survival. This is of 14 months. 
If they put all the other uh, sarcomas, you see that the, the results are much uh, less, so are much less convincing. So this appears to be one of the cases that which, uh, in which the tumor has a strong selectivity. So we thought it was really worthwhile to really to try to understand the specific mechanism in this tumor, even if it is a not very, very frequent disease, we started to study what is known about this tumor. Now, this tumor is, is uh, really, the pathogenesis has uh, is been elucidated because there is a translocation between these uh, two chromosomes involving this transcription factor, CHOP, that is uh, probably, you know better than me, that is uh, one of those factors that is uh, generally expressed at very low level unless you stress the cells. And uh, so this is in this case, instead in these cells, is uh, deregulated, so it's always expressed. Uh, and uh, actually, by morphological point of view, the tumor can be a pure mixoid uh, form or round cells, and this is much more aggressive, or a mixture. Uh, nobody knows uh, what are other lesions. Probably there are other mutations, because uh, uh, in terms of molecular biology, what is known is only the translocation uh, that I was telling you. The translocation, however, also not always in, with the same break, break point, although the, the, the major ones are these two. And uh, so we started to ask around in the world what, what were the cell lines available in, in any kind of uh, bank of cell lines. Uh, and we received a number of cell lines that were claimed to be mixed liposarcoma, but didn't have the translocation, so uh, were really uh, not really representative of the disease. Except two cell lines that we, we obtained from Sweden that had uh, the, the translocation, uh, but uh, di didn't carry the, the major translocation because one was type one, that anyhow was similar to this one, and the other was very different, was type eight, that is a very unusual kind of translocation. But uh, anyhow, with this cell line of type 1, we did some work. And uh, we um, thought, uh, again, with uh, Roberto Mantovani, to help us with these experiments, really, to, to see if uh, the, there was some, something related to the stop of differentiation of this tumor, or the positive differentiation, that could be activated by the drug. And so uh, it appears that the, the, these uh, genes that are related to this process, uh, CBP, alpha and beta are upregulated after treatment in this cell line. And uh, this is uh, also at protein level is, is, has been found. Uh, what is mo more convincing to us, at least we can believe this, is that also Silvana Pilotti in the uh, biopsies of patient treated with the drug confirmed that there was uh, upregulation of this CBP alpha and beta. So uh, we, we, we thought it could be interesting to look, at least in these cell lines, using chromatin IP to see if uh, the drug was interfering with the full chop uh, binding to the promoters of target genes. So we did this kind of experiment with this cell line. And uh, uh, we used, uh, well, this the initial experiment with PTX3 and uh, fibronectin 1 as two target genes of full chop that were known to be uh, target genes in the literature. And unfortunately, we didn't have the antibody for FUS chop for the chimera. So we were using both the antibody against FUS and the antibody against uh, chop because we couldn't really, uh, we didn't, we didn't they do not exist, they are not available, the antibody. But uh, you see, you see a, a strong enrichment in the promoter of the PTX3. And when you treat with the drug, uh, you have a detachment of the, uh, we, of course, before we tested if the synthesis of, of the chimera was changed, it was not. So the drug didn't really interfere with the, with the, um, with the transcription of the chimera. Does the drug, sorry. Yes, hello. No. Yes. So th does the drug interfere only with this target of the fuse chop or with all the other targets of it? Because this yes. has different targets within this. Yes. I tell you that now we know that it interferes with other targets, but we are planning to do uh, the, um, yes. So we are now planning and adapting the method, the method with the uh, uh, nucleases, with microcalcular nucleases to uh, do this. And anticipating uh, my, uh, my question uh, at the end of the talk, so does it relate with the, 
with the function of uh, tabetin to bind to the minor group of the DNA. So, in other words, if you if you modify the the DNA there, so yes. you change the minor group, you change now a little bit. You yeah. So, do you have the same effect or not? So it's, it's I'm wondering. I'm a little bit uh, uh, being molecular biologist yes. uh, afraid of the fact that. Despite the, 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 the strong and uh, very nice effective, uh, no, effect yeah. that this molecule has, there is poor knowledge about the mechanism by which. So, sure. uh, yeah, okay. So no, no, th this is something that uh, is still not clear because we need to have, because we, we obtain a number of analogs yeah. to really try to work out if. if and those compounds that do not have the reactive group that I was mentioning, this carbinol that uh, really bind to nitrogen 2 of guanine, are inactive in all respect to this kind of essence. So you, you need a binding to that. Yeah. Now, so uh, OH, you need the yes, but you know, you can argue, however, that uh, the, since there is one reactive group, it uh, would be the same for proteins. So maybe that it yeah. binds to some. Uh, protein that uh, is also involved. Uh, so it's very difficult to really distinguish between the two things, uh, I think, uh, for the moment. M maybe, uh, well, any suggestion of whether is very welcome, I mean, because we are still really co also collaborating with a number of people. Now the interest of, for this track is much more, so there are many, many other because people that work on this. Question. So we, we always think about yeah. these molecules as a DNA damaging molecule, yeah. which is true, of course. Yes. But, uh, uh, is it just an oversimplification about their, their function? Yes. Because, I mean, OH are present within proteins, okay? Yes. Uh, or other sure. groups are also active in proteins. So does also... No, no, it's something that we, we have not, we, we cannot really have a okay. clear question. No, maybe I go on at the okay, end, sorry, because sorry. of course, uh, I mean, uh, uh, there are still many, many yeah. questions that we are still really... Uh, I must say that uh, we, we were reasonably happy about this mechanism. So somehow explained the possible selectivity because uh, uh, there was evidence that we could di displace uh, uh, the factor that was supposedly responsible for the disease. But uh, we were not happy to use this cell line uh, because uh, uh, this cell line, yes, was the only cell line we could use. <laughs> but was immortalized with SV40, for example. Uh, expressed high level of P53, probably a mutation of P53. Is, instead, the human tumor doesn't have mutated P53. So we said, well, we have to obtain other cell lines, other things. But it happens something very strange. For you that uh, works in oncogenesis and molecular biology, it's something uh, really, I think, unusual. Because this is an oncogene that doesn't really uh, help the proliferation, evidently, because uh, as soon as you have, from primary culture, cells that start to, to grow, you lose the transcript of the chimera. So it sounds uh, a bit uh, uh, not uh, intuitive for, for something that causes cancer. But in, in fact, this tumor is not really highly specialized to grow fast. These tumors, if you look at the history of these patients, the tumor grows very slowly, metastasize, but it takes a very long time. So maybe the, the, the metastasis is operated and then there is another metastasis after one year, after two years. So the, is, is progressing tumor, metastasizing tumor, malignant that lead the patient to, to death, but very slowly. So it's not... A, so if, if we fail to, to obtain cell line uh, ourselves. So we started to, to develop in vivo models and uh, Starting from our, so, sorry, I forgot one thing that maybe if there is some immunologist could be interesting for them. I don't know if, uh, but uh, um, again with Paula, we tested also in primary culture of uh, liposarcoma cells, and we found that there was also down regulation of, of some of this factor I was mentioning before, and some of this have a profound effect on angiogenesis. Uh, um, this was, might be important because this tumor is really a, one of the features of this tumor is a very, um, a very, very heavy 
uh, network of capillaries that disappear the treatment. So maybe that this can be related, but maybe we, we come back at the end. Anyhow, uh, we, we started to use primary cultures, as, as you saw, but just for a short time, but also to try to obtain uh, tumors <coughs> in mice uh, using fragments of tumor from the operation theater, again with the Institute of Tumori, with the surgery, and Roberta Frapolli uh, was extremely uh, good in this, uh, obtained a number of, of uh, xenographs now. She has uh, six uh, xenographs that uh, very slowly but grow, and she also managed to, to have the most representative one of human pathology. Now, I show you just a few things, but some are really very interesting, in my opinion, because, you know, our problem in oncology, in preclinical oncology, is to mimic the human pathology. And so, I think, in my life, this is the best example that we have obtained over the years of a tumor that has really, not only morphologically, very similar from the patient, but also in terms of response to a drug, really, with the same response. And I must say that in both cases, you realize that there is a fish positivity before treatment, but also after treatment. So it means that you don't really eradicate completely the tumor cells. So you, you still have some cells that are positive there, even if we, after an apparently pathological response. And this fits very well with what the clinicians have observed, that in some cases after one year, even two years, uh, there is a patient that has received 51 cycles now with this disease. No? And uh, when they stop, at one point they stop, the tumor re restarts. And if they start the treatment again, respond again. So uh, probably the, the, you don't really eradicate completely the tumor, at least so far has not been obtained the number of scores. But you have a silent uh, uh, presence of the full chop, I guess, uh, there. It is, however, inhibited by the drug, so it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really act as an as, uh, oncogene. Now, this was, in my opinion, extremely interesting. And so we, we started to, to think that this is a tumor for which to, to really investigate the mechanism. It's much more difficult because, of course, it's in vivo and you have to adapt the metho methods. So Silvana, that is doing the PhD uh, uh, in our, uh, in our uh, laboratory, uh, has uh, adapted the method with digestion of this tissue. This, uh, this tumor is very rich in mucopolysaccharides, so it's, it's very low number of cells, so it's difficult to really deal with, but she obtained a really very, very nice data because this is the control, and you see a very uh, high enrichment of the uh, first chop uh, uh, present in this promoter, but uh, she uh, has now more data anyhow. But the, after the first dose, 24 hours after the first dose in vivo, so intravenous dose, there is detachment, then uh, again. But after two weeks uh, without drug, there is again the retouchment of the chimera. Uh, and uh, this is reproducible in, for many promoters, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, she is repeated now in many different uh, uh, xenographs uh, where there are some uh, differences, but altogether the data are very consistent. That is, in fact, uh, we have now written a protocol to do it in the clinic, has already passed the ethical committee to obtain biopsy before and after and to really test if also in the clinic there is this kind of effect. Now, this is uh, also in line with what Paola found in, uh, in cells. We, we asked the question whether in this xenography we could detect changes related to the stroma and to microenvironment that could also be important. And uh, uh, in xenography, you find that uh, the treated mice have uh, no essentially uh, CD31 positive cells and also the macrophages decreased very much. And this also at the early time point of treatment. And this appears to be now a very, very potentially important mechanism of the drug for solid tumors. And um, at least um, also the, the immunologists that we know, Alberto and so on, are quite excited because they think that many, many people are trying now to, to do this kind of thing, to decrease the number of macrophages in the tumor because the macrophages produce a lot of factor, androgenic factor, growth factor, and so on. So it can be actually, it was not anticipated as an 
initial mechanism, but uh, maybe that in some cases an important mechanism. Also, androgenic factor that you see chemokines, and this is the factor that is uh, dis uh, been discovered by these criminologists today. So uh, yes. Are these, these cytokines, by anyhow, regulated by the transgene? Sorry, by the, uh, by the no. future? No, I, I don't. I don't think so, because is uh, well in in the tumor cells. Yes, there is is also reported that can be also, but we we find also that in monocytes, the cytokines are downregulated by the drug. So it means that uh, in monocytes, uh, I mean, of course, there is not uh, the chimera. So there are normal monocytes. Yeah, there are not chimera, but the, yeah, there are the you know the, the, the description factors. Well, you mean. That Chop, them, yeah, yes, but this has not been studied. It's something. Well, this is something that we, we should study. Um, I mean, I I think that uh, yes, perhaps this is a possibility. Yes, um, I mean, uh, I have asked Paula to look at, through all the the regulations of these things, and I mean, NFKB can be one of the major. Uh, factor to, to investigate in according to what they they told me. I want just to show you that some of these data have been reproduced. Uh, I mean, the antibodies that have used were uh, main, uh, CD31 and CD68, also in the human biopsies. So also in the human biopsy, it appears that there is uh, down regulation of this uh, uh, after treatment. Now, the the difficulty now is that, okay, we have this very specific mechanism for CHOP, it's very interesting, scientifically also makes sense somehow, but we have also a number of data that suggest that this is just true for that specific tumor because we have evidence that the drug is active also in other tumors. For example, we, we knew that it was is active in ovarian cancer, so we, in ovarian cancer, why it is active, we don't know. Maybe it's more related to the monocytes, macrophages for inflammation to other mechanisms. Uh, so I, I tell you this because of course uh, we like to have a, a, a clear, uh, I mean, uh, um, hypothesis driven development of things, but sometimes things do not fit. So uh, the finding that in vivo, in many xenographs was extremely, uh, the drug was very active, stimulated us to say, well, let's try to see what happens in ovarian cancer. So here in Italy, we have some good group in ovarian cancer. So we, we stimulate them to really do a phase two study. And uh, the phase two study was very positive because uh, there was in patients that had received already many lines of treatment, about 40% responded to trabectin alone. And so uh, we, we asked PharmaMar to do a big studies, but they, they couldn't afford to do a big studies. So they, they found an agreement with an American multinational company, this Johnson & Johnson, that bought the drug in, for the states and organized a big tri clinical trial in ovarian cancer. So the big clinical trial was, to, so was somehow generated by this company. So it was, uh, they had already this compound for ovarian cancer. So what they did was to add uh, trabectin to this compound. So somehow, didn't really cause any problem for them because this is the, the compound that really is commercialized for second line chemo, uh, ovarian cancer. So in this case, trabectin would not replace their compound, but just be something that for them could be advantage. So I don't think it was, would be the best design because I would be much more happy to see what the drug alone was doing. Anyhow, uh, we have to live with this kind of problems. And so, the, 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 the studies were done in many hundreds of patients all over the world, and the results are not really spectacular, but show that the arm with trabectidin is superior to the arm of... Uh, for those who are not used to the clinical trial uh, data, may be a bit disappointing for, perhaps for Giannino and me, I mean, it's sort of small difference. For those who really used to clinical trials, you see sometimes curves that are really much closer and they found uh, really fantastic data. So this is really not that good, but uh, anyhow, there is some effects in ovarian cancer. Uh, maybe that this, I found this more interesting, perhaps, uh, that uh, uh, some uh, patients that have been after trabectidin and uh, 
toxorubicin were then treated again with another line of, of chemotherapy at the first line of chemotherapy they received, and apparently there is a, a much more uh, important effect in terms of survival. But this is really few, uh, is not enough to really uh, have a definitive uh, uh, word. But anyhow, uh, I think that there is anyhow activity and there is really, uh, I mean, enough uh, uh, data to say that this is an active compound, this tumor. Of course, it would be nice to have the drug before, not uh, so late in the treatment, and also to test alone and not, uh, in my opinion, but anyhow, this is... Uh, um, I, I, I convinced the company to do a phase, two stu phase one study, and Christiana Sessa did a phase one study with cisplatinum and trabectidin, and it's possible to do it. So I hope that to, uh, to, to really be able to, to, to really start some studies early on, with the, but uh, it will be probably now not so easy to really organize this. It, uh, we are dependent on the company to do these things. It's very difficult to do it in an independent way. Now, I, I want really to, to say so something that is may, maybe particularly, in general, I show this uh, to uh, particularly to clinicians that are using the drug because there is some really very particular about the drug that uh, in many cases the, 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 the response is not obtained immediately. So we observe this also in mice, but it's very clear in clinic that uh, in some cases you obtain response after three, four, five cycles. And again, suggesting that this effects on the host might be even more important the anti-proliferative effect because otherwise you expect an effect just after treatment. So this is something that has been really seen in my many, my many clinicians, uh, um, I don't know if uh, people at European Institute of Oncology for example have done the phase two study in ovarian cancer or Nicoletta Colombo and she is really uh, saw this and also the Institute of Tumor for Sarcoma. The other thing is that in many cases, some cases, the, 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 the response is very prolonged. And we are thinking to a number of hypotheses for this. Maybe that uh, what we were telling you about the angiogenesis, something we are really looking now with uh, angiogenesis experts. And uh, maybe that there are some epigenetic mechanism. I tell you this because we, we obtain a resistance cell line in vitro. And uh, this, uh, there is evidence that some genes have changed the pattern of methylation after repeated treatment. So maybe that uh, this could be a possible mechanism, but it's still to, to, investi to be investigated. The other thing, and for this there is very little evidence, that maybe it uh, also, uh, another interpretation for the delayed response is that uh, you hit a compartment of cells that uh, is not cancer stem cell, but maybe early differentiated cells, maybe, that, uh, so you, you don't see the effect immediately in terms of shrink of the tumor, but you have to wait uh, to see the effect. But this is just a hypothesis. So just to re recapitulate, I think that, uh, I think I've probably been enough, uh, I mean, I've increased your confusion about probably uh, the, this compound because of the multiplicity of the mechanism, but actually, I mean, uh, I cannot really be very simple in this because we still know very little and probably will uh, know just a part of uh, what is the, the real mechanism. But I think that certainly uh, there is evidence that the compound binds to DNA and probably this is an important thing, I guess, because as I was, tell told, I was telling you, the structure is really made to be bound to the minor grooves, <laughs> so matches very well. So it suggests to me that the nature has not done this by chance. No? Um, you have been working in Nerviano and uh, there were all this class of compounds of this tamicin that were really fascinating because they, they rebind exactly in the minor groove where, where there are stretches of adenine time, for example. No? But very, very, you, you, you cannot invent a molecule that, uh, that really uh, been matches better the, the the, the minor group. So the fact that this is also so well, um, um, I mean, uh, binds so well in the minor group, I think is probably, but anyhow, this is still to be demonstrated. Transcription certainly is very important. Maybe not only for the presence of altered transcription factors, but maybe there are also something else that we, we still don't know in terms of the modification of the structure, maybe of the complexes. This is still very difficult to, 
to investigate for us at the moment. I think that the, the anti-proliferative effect related to DNA repair on, or that we, we, we mentioned might have some role, but now I am suspect that this is not the major aspect of the, the tumor mechanism action. And this is also uh, taking the observation of the clinicians that told me that generally this drug works much better for tumors that are not growing very, very fast. So for example, also in, in mice tumors, it's completely active in very fast growing leukemias, for example. That I mean, has nothing to do with the replication of DNA. This is something that I would really suggest. And so all these effects now, even though is, of course, is the field mainly of immunologists rather than my own field, I think is going to be more and more important in the future. You know, in all these years, we have been really working, uh, really in close collaboration with many people in preclinical field, but also in the clinical, and we have really managed to have a good feedback from the clinic to the laboratory and so on. And, and so I think that uh, at the end, we, we think that there are a number of mechanisms that are interesting about this compound, so we, we don't think uh, is uh, just another DNA binding agent like the others, I mean, is has some originality in terms of mechanism. Uh, I think that uh, uh, probably in each tumor there are more than one mechanism that uh, has uh, a role. And after all is, I mean, also target therapy is moving towards multi-target uh, um, target therapy. So it is very rare in very, very single disease at probably at early stage of the evolution that you can really think to have an, a strong effect, significant effect with a, a specific target. So far, the results altogether have been very disappointing. So to have a, a, a compound that acts at the level of transcription is quite interesting because drug design has not really been successful in this field. So now I admit that uh, we, we still don't know the rules of how it changes the transcription. So we have to be empirical at the moment, try to, to, to work out what, what the observation, and then going back to the, to the laboratory. But uh, uh, I think that, uh, <coughs> I think that, uh, I'm sh I think that this doesn't mean that uh, to do science and to really work uh, in, in the laboratory to, to alter the mechanism can be very significant because as we are doing for mixed liposarcoma, probably we can work out for each tumor what are the specific mechanisms. Now, just to, to really finally to, to give a message also to, for uh, young investigators, young scientists, that uh, I think that more and more, this is probably obvious to you, but uh, I think that it is very difficult to do something very significant in terms of the therapy without, without having a team with many kind of expertise that really, uh, I should mention also bioinformatics because of course this is going to be more and more important. Uh, you were mentioning which are the promoters that really count. I mean, uh, this kind of experiment, uh, we were trying to do these experiments, but then the, the bioinformatic part will be very, very important in this type of effort. And I think that uh, of course uh, we need also uh, clinicians that are, uh, also trained to understand this kind of uh, mechanism, how to really improve these things and uh, also motivation to do this. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, I hope that uh, also with our project we will uh, develop uh, in the future. Uh, many, many people, I just mentioned some of them, but uh, of my own group, of course, many, many people. Uh, at the beginning, Massimo Brogini, Giovanni Dana, the, then now the youngest, the Silvan Gian Domenico that is doing the chromatin IP at the moment, Raffaella, Roberta that obtained the, the xenografts. The, the, the British group, and particularly the pathologists that uh, gave us this clue about uh, inflammation and the uh, the group of immunologists, uh, Marco Foyani was also important at the beginning because, uh, you know, there was, uh, when he did the experiments with the NCI, one lab of the NCI suggested that it was a TOPO1 inhibitor, and it was also published a paper saying that it was a TOPO1 inhibitor. And uh, so uh, we did the experiment, I thought it was not because it was not causing breaks in DNA, but uh, 
anyhow, it was Yves Pommier. So it was somebody that is highly respected in the field. So we did the experiment uh, with yeast, uh, with the deleted yeast, uh, and it was equally effective. So it was really cutting, I mean, uh, clearing up the fact that at least it was not a topo one, <laughs> because it was, already, it was already complex without uh, to involving toposomerases. So, and actually also, uh, although we knew already in cells, it reproduced in yeast that the homologous recombination is very important. So some of the experiments in yeast really can be very informative actually for the mechanism. Uh, also, uh, well, Paola Lavena, uh, the group at uh, Tomori, uh, the group at uh, uh, Early Drug Development, Cristiana Sessa particularly, but also Luca Gianni, and also Nicoletta Colombo for ovarian cancer, Filippo De Bro that did the phase one study. So I think uh, uh, the, finally, this is Mario Negri where I am. So I hope that we will have a meeting there in the near future. And so some of you can visit. And some part of this work has been supported by ARCS that uh, we thank, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you.